questions from there, just like we've discussed. <laughs>
all the old poems are about loss, all the new ones also. <laughs> um, my husband died almost five years ago now, and I wrote the book that uh, Rob mentioned through the Garden of Love Story with Cats about our lives together in which poetry is a character. And uh, after he died, I edited a book of poems he had left behind. And while I was doing that, I was working on my own. And once his book came out last year, I pulled my manuscript together and it just came out. I had the first launch of Monroe's books on Wednesday night. So I, I hope I can read these poems without breaking down, but they, they all feel rather new to me at the moment. Let There Be Angels. William Blake heard angels singing. I wonder what you heard at the end. The trauma doctor said, talk to him if you want, he can hear you. This was before he turned off the machine. I talked to you between kisses. I kissed your mouth, your eyes, lowered the sheet and kissed your chest and belly. I took your long feet in my hands and kissed your toes and the pale souls mapped with where you'd walked for almost 80 years. I took the palms of your hands and laid them on me the last time they would touch me. I held each hand between mine the way I'd hold a broken bird. I talked. I didn't say anything that would surprise you, but my mouth was busy. Maybe you weren't pleased. You wanted more. In times that mattered, we always tried to say something the other didn't know. When I stop saying your name, the words of the old calligrapher in Hung Zhou, the ink he made from water and ground graphite blackening his tongue, where the brush strokes stop, the snow begins. Parcel. In the bag I carry from the crematorium, you weigh more than the heart of a horse. How do I know how much that is? I don't. But I say to myself, you weigh more than the heart of a horse. I have a series in here called Ways to Keep on Going, and it moves from seven ways and goes down to one, one way to keep on going is the last poem in the book, but I will read seven ways to keep on going. Take on another language, an alphabet of bone and sinew and grit. Chew the gristle and learn by heart the songbook's oldest songs before you try to speak his name. Draw his feet long and elegant, the shape of them like two slim trout. Take extra time with the toes you took into your mouth. Find the word that means the sky after a swan has flown through, a mute swan with wide white wings. The noun has been lost because too many fluent in this grasslands dialect when they look up see only emptiness. Remember everything. No, don't do that. The hawk and owl feathers he found in the fields and kept in a jar on his desk, glue them to the hollow near your shoulder blades where you once had wings. You can wear his leather jacket then and it won't look big. Observe the ways of insects. An ant uses the body of another ant to build a bridge over the gap between the planks on the deck so he can get to where he needs to go. Sleep on both sides of the bed. Confuse the cat. <laughs> and finally, because it connects with the question, that Rob is going to be asking us, I hope. You I will, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Almost a children's story. This will be the last one. Almost a children's story. One day, you met a fox by the railway tracks. 
Both of you stopped in the tall grass and looked at one another. Don't make a big deal out of this, said the fox. I'm just a fox. Mm -hmm. One day you met a magpie high in the spruce. Both of you stayed still and looked at one another. Don't make a big deal out of this, said the magpie. I'm just a magpie. But if you want to help, tell the monk to put away his rifle. I won't eat the robin's babies. One day you met a snake between the raspberry bushes. Both of you froze and looked at one another. He'd been sipping the clear liquid around the mouths of the bottles hidden in the wood pile, the ivy, the brambles. When he spoke, he slurred and hissed. It was hard for you to listen, but you're sure he didn't say, I'm just a snake. Did this mean he was someone else? It was a haunting, a visitation? Why is it the bad days come back and not the good? That was amazing. Thank you. I, I had to run over and get my bag just so I could write down quotes. Oh, <laughs> I was like, I don't want to interrupt you, but I need to, I need to be writing some of those down. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from Tara McGuire. Uh, Tara is a former broadcaster whose first book, Holden After and Before, Love Letter for a Son Lost to Overdose, is a hybrid work in memoir and fiction exploring grief, motherhood, and the overdose crisis. It was published by Arsenal Pulp Press in the fall of 2022. And uh, we are very happy to announce, I think, was recently named a finalist for the City of Vancouver Book Award, which is wonderful news. Um, and um, that's her, her essays, pardon? That's good. What, did I get it wrong? No, that's enough. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm going to say, oh, I know. Every time someone reads my bio, I'm like, no, we're done. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go all the way here, sorry. Her essays have appeared in Chatelaine, The Globe and Mail, Geist, Room, uh, The Taiyi, and on CBC Radio. Uh, she has an MFA from the University of British Columbia School of Creative Writing and is a graduate of the Writer's Studio at Simon Fraser University. So if you're thinking of doing a writing program in the Lower Mainland, Tara can secretly tell you which one is better. <laughs> yeah, secretly, yes. Um, <laughs> and Tara lives in North Vancouver. And the floor is yours, Tara. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, we were talking about surprises um, as a as a way to get into these readings, and um, knowing that I was here with these beautiful poets, um, I thought I would think about the poetry work that I did in one of those writing programs, and I got to work with Amber Dawn and um, another beautiful poet, Sharita Warner, and Sharita really encouraged me to use nouns um, and the strength of nouns to embody people who are no longer here, but their objects are very important. So that's why I picked this reading. And um, um, when someone dies uh, suddenly, their stuff is put in a box and then eventually you get the box. <laughs> so um, that's what this reading is about. It's dangerous to love something so much. More of you can be stolen. I nodded and Cam gently closed the box coaxed it from my reluctant hands and took it down to the basement where he placed it on a shelf in the storage room with the camping gear and Christmas decorations. I wanted and didn't want to look. I wanted and didn't want to know. Months later, I wore sweatpants so it was probably fall. On a day when I was alone in the house, I crept down to the storage room and reached for the box. I sat on the cold cement floor with the box between my knees and opened it. There were the brown paper bags. There were the labels, t-shirt, blue, work gloves, brown, foil. Tucked in the corner under his backpack, wedged behind the heel of one of his dusty work boots was an envelope the size of a paper bag, Samsung mobile phone. I snatched the envelope, slammed the box's lid closed and ran up the stairs before the pungent stale dirt scent of Holden's work shirt and socks could sabotage my plans. Upstairs in the kitchen, heart hammering, I slid the phone out of the envelope onto the counter. At first, I didn't touch it. The screen was cracked in a splintered web, but not shattered. I saw the thick, greasy smudges of Holden's fingerprints all over it, likely the last thing his hands had touched. And then I could see his hands, 
how the fingers of the right hand curled in a loose claw ever since his accident with the knife, how his knuckles widened and his fingernails were chewed close. I saw the paint, the raw hangnails, the soil. But the phone was not my property, it was his. Was I betraying a trust by looking at his private information or was this knowledge now mine? transferred to me as his next of kin with the rest of his worldly possessions. What if I found out things I didn't want to know? I would definitely find out things I didn't want to know. <laughs> I poured myself a glass of water from the tap and downed it. I braced myself, grabbing the edge of the counter. My arm muscles contracted. The word ethics flashed somewhere and was quickly overruled. This was a way to find out. I picked up the phone. There were worn stickers on the back a red one that said layout and a small blue one that said ACAB. I'd have to look those up. <laughs> I pressed the power button and the phone vibrated, chimed three times and buzzed to life. So easily revived. Where to look first? I wanted to see him. Photos. Not familiar with Android, I stalled searching for the right icon. I tapped and the screen filled with a gallery of color. The last picture Holden had taken was of a concert poster stapled to a telephone pole advertising a heavy metal show at Pat's Pub on Hastings Street, July 3rd. Something the shape and size of a fist lodged low in my throat. July 3rd was the date printed on Holden's death certificate, the day whose sunrise he would not live to see. But he had wanted to hear some live music that night. I scrolled and a spur of sharp glass shaved the edge of my thumb. The shot before that was of a forested trail, blackberries, salal, ivy, and dappling light. The one before that showed he'd been up on a hillside, looking out over the ocean with cobalt islands rising from the sea along the horizon, the sky a brilliant shade of blue. The next was of a golden grassy road long forgotten by cars, it looked like the view from Rec Beach near the university. The photo was time-stamped one week before he died. Looking at Holden's photographs transported me through time and space. I could be where he had been, see what he had seen, get some sense of his mood. These photographs were not dark and destructive. They were bright, beautifully composed and calm. I felt the heat of summer on my face, smelled the sea, the warm pine sap, I heard him laugh, saw him rake his hand through his scrub of hair and tug on his auburn tassel of beard. I smelled his breath. Oh, there was the arc of the highway overpass. He must have been painting graffiti. He'd been close to our house. There was the rushing Capilano River. He was almost home. I saw another forested trail. He'd been hiking or at least walking in the forest. The next picture showed a distorted, almost time-exposed image of his face, surrounded by leaves and reflected, refracted sunbeams filtering through a luminous green canopy, his last selfie, his last documented green. Any conflict I felt about opening his phone disappeared. During the last week of his life, Holden had been in nature. He had been in motion, looking for beauty and finding it. He had been creating it. For the first time in months, I thought of my son with something other than sadness. My tear-streaked cheeks rose in an unfamiliar arc. He had lived. Ooh, that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, I should have anticipated being emotional in this panel, but here we are. <laughs> Didn't bring any tissue with me or anything. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, our third reader um, is Eve Joseph. Eve has a book that is more uh, rare than uh, Sasquatch um, <laughs> in that it was uh, it went out of print and it, it's, it's come back. It's a very uh, rare and exciting event that, uh, if we're lucky, happened to the very best books, which is the case here. Um, so this book has, in the slender margin, The Intimate Strangeness of Death and Dying has just been republished by Anvil uh, Press, and we're very, very excited about that. And you'll get to hear an a excerpt from it in just a second after I read this introduction. Um, 
Eve Joseph lives and writes on the unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen people. Uh, her first two books of poetry, The Startled Heart and The Secret Signature of Things, were both nominated for the Dorothy Livesay Award. Her nonfiction book, In the Slender Margin, was published by Harper Collins in 2014 and won the Hubert Evans Award for nonfiction at that time. Um, her most recent book of poetry, Quarrels, was nominated for the Dorothy Livesay Award, the Relit Award, and won the 2019 Griffin Poetry Prize. It's here for Eve. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Rob. I do want to thank um, Karen Green and uh, Brian Kaufman and Jessica Kay from Anvil. Um, and just so ecstatic that a small press would, would pick it up and they're just, they've just been absolutely wonderful. Um, I thought today, and I'd also like to thank Bonnie Nish for the festival and all the, <clears throat> the work that goes into this. It's a great venue this year. Um, today I was, I'm going to read a few small sections having to do with language because I think that's one of the things that unites the three of us is that how we've had to find words, how we've had to mine uh, language to find what often feels um, inexpressible. Is the mic okay? This is the strangest mic mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> they look like frogs. Petrified frogs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> Language, says ethnobotanist Wade Davis, is not simply a set of grammatical rules or vocabulary. It is a flash of the human spirit, a window of sorts into the cosmology of our lives. Nowhere is the power of language more evident than in our language around death. My husband Patrick grew up in Steinbeck, Manitoba, a small Mennonite town on the prairies. His father died at age 55 leaving behind a young family. When Patrick wrote in the obituary that his father had died, the pastor at his father's church stroked out the word died and replaced it with passed away. Death was not an end in the town with 26 churches and a population of around 3,000. <laughs> it was a passage to another life, a new beginning. Rarely is death called by its own name. The language of dying is not static. It is a language of movement, of platforms, tickets, passports, and maps, visitations and greetings, entrances and exits, a language of arrivals and departures. They will often ask if their bags are packed or if there's a full tank of gas in the car. They repeat themselves, asking if the train is on time, asking if you will be coming with them. You must enter this as you would enter a foreign land. Signs will be of little help. You must see what they see. It is rarely planes they wait for. Rather, they pull away slowly from this earth, the fields of fall rye rolling as far as the eye can see. It is an esemplastic language that sees this world at the same time it sees another. Much like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, the dying too are often preoccupied with time. I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. No time to say hello, hello, uh, goodbye. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Sometimes they wait for someone to arrive from out of town. Sometimes they die when people have stepped out of the room for five minutes to have a smoke. One day in ICU, a boy who'd been hanging on for weeks after an accident died within minutes of his mother telling him it was okay to go. The wonder is not that the dying might wait, that a boy might need his, mother, <clears throat> his mother's permission, but that the living might sometimes be able to open the door for them. One man told me he was going hiking in the mountains, excuse me, <clears throat> but was a bit anxious because he didn't have a map. Another man on his deathbed told his wife a yellow cab had pulled up in front of his house. The fool's got the wrong address, he said, but since he's here, I may as well go. <laughs> His wife looked out the window to the empty street and she said, yes, love, you may as well. The metaphors of departure and everlasting life do not apply as readily to sudden death. There is an uncertainty to the language, a flicker of doubt. Where was God, we wonder, when life was cut short and someone was taken from us? <clears throat> Where was he the night my brother was killed? 
When something is killed, life is by definition extinguished. That feels accurate. Ian was snuffed out like a candle. One minute there was light, the next we were standing disoriented, trying to adjust our eyes to the pervasive dark. In the 2011 edition of Best American Essays, Edwidge Danticat writes, through recent experiences with both birth and death, I have discovered that we enter and leave life as among other things, words. Many of us start life, she muses, as whispers or rumors. Born into language, we take in the sounds of voices, the sound of wind in the trees, the clattering of dishes, the cooing voices of our mothers, the day-to-day -day prattle that goes on above our cribs, and we make of this our native tongue. On our way out, we may once again speak the indecipherable language of our childhood kingdoms. If it is close to, if, sorry, if it is close to impossible to translate the music at the heart of poetry, the same must be said for any attempts to precisely translate the dying process. The word translation derives from the Latin translatus, meaning to bring over, to carry over. To translate is to remove from one place to another. Seen in this light, death itself is an act of translation. Poetry's fertility, writes Jane Hirschfield, lives in the marriage of the said and the unsaid, of languaged self and unlanguaged other, of the knowable world and the gravitational pull of what lies beyond knowing. We can interpret the physical signs of dying, but there remains an element of the untranslatable in both poetry and dying, a mystery at the heart of both, something only the dying know. Thank you so much for that. Um, as I think everyone has, uh, they've been hinting at, I, I did request a theme for the readings, um, and that theme was of surprise. We were talking about focusing this on how do you write through loss and how do you write as a means of processing loss. And um, from my own perspective, one of the great things about writing is that we end up saying things we never intended to say when we sat down and we end up surprising ourselves as authors. And when you're writing about a personal loss, that can mean you, you gain new insights into that loss and into the process of losing and grieving. So I had asked everyone if they could share um, something that surprised them in, in, in the writing of their books. Um, so I'm hoping now that you've all read your pieces, if you could uh, either specifically about the piece you read, what it was it that surprised you in there. We had talking magpies appear out of nowhere. You know, we had all <laughs> kinds of surprises. Um, mm -hmm. But if you could speak either to the pieces or just in general to what surprised you in the process of taking on the, the, the writing projects that you took on. I'll let whoever wants to go first, go first. Lorna, you haven't talked in the longest time, so if you <laughs> okay. want to start. I guess um, whenever I write a poem, I'm surprised. And if I'm not, then I know the poem is stillborn. Um, it, it flubbed. It's not something I'm probably going to share with anybody else. Um, to quote, you know, a cliche from Robert Frost, no tears for the writer, no tears for the reader, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that if a poem doesn't give me a little shiver of, oh, I didn't know I knew that, or, oh, I didn't know that's what I wanted to say, or where the hell did that image come from, then, then the poem isn't, I don't think, a, a good poem from my perspective. So I'm, I'm surprised every time I write a poem. Um, these poems, I think the big surprise was that I could do it at all, that I could find words at all. And I, I kind of proved that to myself when I wrote the nonfiction book that preceded this. Um, I wrote that book when Patrick Lane, who was my husband, was very ill with an undiagnosed illness that went on for about four years and it kept announcing itself in one terrible symptom after another. I had to call the ambulance, I think five times. He was that close to death over that long period of time. But anyway, I went into my office and I wrote the story of our lives because I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know how to get through the days. And I said, oh, well, you, you get through, you've gotten through your life so far by writing. So just go and tell the story of your lives. 
And I did. And I started with this illness, but I went right back to when we met and the five cats we'd shared our lives with over those 40 years and the tempestuous, passionate life we had led together, not always easy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was amazed that those 26 letters of the alphabet could do it for me again. I, I wrote the book in some ways for language mm -hmm. uh, to say, you know what, you can find words even for this. And so after Patrick died, again, I had to find a way to move, to move in my life, maybe not move forward, to move sideways in my life. That book was not a consolation. This book is not a consolation mm -hmm. either. People want you to say, yeah, this was a consolation. Um, for me, it, it, it wasn't. It was just uh, the way I've always been. I've been a writer uh, for a long, long time. So I, I deal with things by trying to find words, and sometimes I can't, and sometimes I can't. But the surprise is always in the poems. I read the one about the magpie and, uh, and the fox and the snake because the surprise for me, the, the, the biggest surprise was the ending when the snake appears and the line is, why is it the bad days come back and not the good? Mm -hmm. I was surprised that that darkness came in that poem. Um, I missed even the bad days of being with Patrick mm -hmm. when he was an alcoholic. Um, as well as the good days when he became a sober man the last 20 years of our lives together. And it surprised me that that dark thread had entered the work when I so wanted him with me, no matter what state he would have been in. I'm curious what, having written the, the memoir, did that change in any way what you did when you wrote the poems? Like how you, did you feel like because you wrote that you could, go some different places or you weren't as burdened to get things right or something in the poem? I, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I wrote the memoir the way I'd write a poem. I wrote it <laughs> sentence by sentence by sentence. And I revised those bloody sentences about a hundred times. And I don't think most prose writers do that. Eve probably does because she comes at prose from, from being a poet first. So I, and I got the, you know, I wanted to get the rhythm, the sound right in that memoir. So I was reading the sentences out loud for the rhythm as well. So it was just a, big, thick, long poem. Yeah. And this is a skinny little book <laughs> with shorter lines and shorter pages. <laughs> That's good. All right, Karen, do you want to speak to your piece or to the thing? Uh, sure. I, 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 I started writing this book with like not a clue how to do it. And um, so I think the whole process was a surprise really for me. But uh, based on this piece, the most surprising element was that I decided to write that like it's if you have if you're not familiar with the book it's a two voiced narrative where the memoir pieces are first person um, past tense but the Holden pieces are and I'm calling them sort of informed fiction are um, mm -hmm. present tense and I realized that it, I had I hadn't written them in present tense initially I'd written the whole the whole book in past tense but then I realized that I wanted him to be still mm -hmm. alive and walking around and doing his stuff, his life, being a young man in the city and running up against all kinds of trouble and joy and creativity and love and his friends and his his movements. And so for me, uh, I guess the big surprise was that I could be with him in some bizarre way because I was writing him in present tense. And so therefore I had to envision him clearly and revise those sentences and those tangible feelings and those sensory details I had to spend so much time in those sections that I did have this weird feeling mm -hmm. of still kind of being present with him, which was actually a gift, even though it was incredibly difficult several years. <laughs> yeah. I love in your acknowledgments for the book, you write, uh, you thank J.J. Lee, your mentor um, at the Writer's Studio, I believe, uh, who swore a great deal while telling me my own story had a place alongside Holden's. And, I was, and you were kind of touching on that, but about letting yourself be present in the book and letting the, yeah. the two of you. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Sure. The, the, in the Writer's Studio, which is a fantastic program at Simon Fraser, I was in the um, nonfiction um, cohort. 
And I just wanted to write Holden's life, like arms length, like kind of just, I didn't know what had happened. There was so much I didn't know about his life and I wanted to make a fictionalized version of it. And JJ was like, you're in the nonfiction cohort for a reason. <laughs> like, what do you think this fucking book is about anyway? <laughs> but, you know, JJ, like he's very endearing, but he's, he has a bit of a sailor mouth. So anyway, and he wears a poncho, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, so yeah, he's like, you have to also be present in this book. And I didn't, I really didn't want to. The first draft was just all stories about Holden running around doing his thing. And I wasn't in there at all. And then of course he was right. Um, that in order to, um, have a reasonable structure of a book, there needed to be something to hold it up. And that was me and, and my reactions and reflections on those fictional scenes that I was creating. So, um, yeah, the structure changed a lot over the the process of writing the book. And even, um, you know, after it was out with publishers, I had to rewrite it again a couple of times. Um, so it, it did change a lot in that way. It was a lot of tough sledding. But the surprise was that the book ended up being more of a memoir, <laughs> actually, that I had thought it was a fiction novel. <laughs> in which it was not. <laughs> May I say too, you're such an interesting character in that book. Oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you created yeah. this persona who's also you. Thank you. So I, we're said seeing one theme here, books that are supposed to be one thing and they're ending up another thing or they're memoirs that are poems or they're, yeah, that's great. That openness to that movement. Mm -hmm. Can you speak yeah, to that? I think I think books generally start out as one thing and turn into something else which surprises us all what, what so a number of things what's what surprised me is it took a long time for me to, i worked at hospice for 21 years i was a counselor at hospice and so i thought at some point i would try and write write a book i, I had to leave hospice and I, it took 10 years before i could actually write these stories and i did not expect my brother to show up it was not it was not i wasn't thinking this will be a memoir about my loss you know it was i had hospice stories in my mind right and it very very i think he's on page one yeah um so background background is i was 11 when he died he was killed in a car accident when he was 27. um he was a brilliant scholar at ubc um and so i was thinking of this of the, of the three of us here and how you, if, if tell me if this isn't correct, how you're writing from a loss, a, a, you know, recent, you know, hard losses. And I found I was writing towards a loss. Um, it had been a long time ago. And so what surprised me was the serendipitous things that kept, that happened. It's like, you can't count on those things to happen, but when they do, they're just a, mar they're, they, they, they're a marvel. I told my daughter Celia yesterday about one of them. Um, we'd gone uh, to uh, the beach at UBC, and I said, <clears throat> I was invited when I, I hadn't, I was in the just beginning parts of the book, and I was invited to read at Green, uh, UBC at Green College uh, to do a you know, little uh, a workshop on grief. And so I got there early. I always get places early because I don't think there'll be parking. Um, so I got there like an hour early and parked, there was lots of parking. So I thought, well, I'll just walk up this, it looked like there was East Boulevard right in front of me. So I walked up East Boulevard. And as I was walking, I thought, I'm sure Ian did a thesis here. I, I knew nothing about it. My mom didn't talk about it. She didn't go to his grave. Um, and so I stopped and this young woman was coming up with headphones and I patted her on the shoulder and I said, is there a library? And she looked at me and she said, well, it's right beside you. You're standing right beside it. Um, and so I went in and there was a, a really lovely librarian who was busy with someone else. And I had to get back, you know, it was time to get back to, to, to the place. Um, but she made time and I said, you know, my brother, I believe wrote a thesis in 1962. I don't know what it was on. Um, this was his name. And she said, just leave it with me. And I got a call that night, email that night that she had found his thesis and it was on poetry. It was on oh, wow. Spencer and Dunn. And, <laughs> and you didn't Marla. know that I didn't far. know. Mom wow. didn't know. Interesting. And so these 
these gifts, like my brother returned in ways to me in the writing of this book that there would have been no way to anticipate. That was the big surprise. Yeah, yeah, I had assumed it was the other way around. You started with your brother. Yeah, that's no, that's right no, here. he surprised me. Um, that actually connects with uh, some, uh, something that I thought was very interesting um, in, in the acknowledgments of your book, um, where you um, you thank P.K. Page, who a conversation with her kind of sparked the idea mm -hmm. of writing this book. And that conversation, you said, was around how metaphor is also the language of dying. We and, told, yeah. And I was curious if you could just expand on that a little bit for us, especially in light of your brother's interest in poetry as well, like it seems to be. Well, we, I remember the conversation, you know, we're, we're having, we're talking about metaphor and, and saying that uh, PK said that poetry, that metaphor is the engine of poetry. And I said, it's the engine of the dying as well. It's how people speak. It's, you know, I, it's so incredible when I, you know, over the years at hospice, when I came to understand that metaphoric language was, was the language that you could enter, um, you know, sometimes doctors or not as much anymore, I don't think, would try to um, orient people to, to, you know, time and space in a real way. But if you just listen to what people were saying, um, you know, metaphorically, like your bags are packed or, you know, the taxi at the door or... There was a woman I met early on who said, you know, they're jackhammering my street. They're jackhammering my street. Where am I going to live? And so, you know, you understand, you can enter that. And you can you can have a conversation about, well, I don't know, where are you going to live? You know, it's, it's metaphors. Just, uh, I've heard that as, as well with Alzheimer's, that people often will try and orient people with Alzheimer's to, you know. Reality. Yeah, reality. But if you enter where they are, and that's through metaphor, um, you can you can enter their world in a way that perhaps you you might not be able to. Yeah, yeah it's very powerful. I don't know if either of you want to chime in on that. The floor is yours if you want. I can ask you a new question. <laughs> okay, ask a new question. Okay, new question. Um, one thing that uh, struck me in the uh, introduction to In the Slender Margin. Uh, Eve quotes Victoria Chang, who said, sorrow is plural, but grief is singular. And I see um, a parallel there to what most of us we teach young writers, that the path to the universal is through the individual or through the singular. Um, and I was just curious for all three of you, um, to what extent you thought about that kind of a balance and to what extent to what you might have done about it in terms of um, balancing your own particular loss with a shared loss, a desire to communicate a larger thoughts on grief and loss, um, and between that singular grief you were experiencing, and especially Tara, I think in your case, you know, it's a grief that many have experienced, and you're trying to speak about it in a broader way as well, mm -hmm. and how you balance those two, or if you need to balance them. Um, I don't know if you have something you could say on it right yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was conveyed very clearly um, that we we do access the universal through this specific, and I worked really hard to be as specific and detailed as possible. And now my book's been out since the fall, and of course, thousands of people continue to die uh, because of the overdose crisis and other ways too. And I've been approached by, I've received beautiful letters and just met people at different events who've said, you articulated what I've experienced exactly. And I said, oh, really? Did your son die of an overdose? And they're like, no, my grandma got hit by a car or just yeah. whatever. Yeah. Like, it's not, yeah, yeah. it's not those exact details. It's the feeling that we all have of that ripping away of something that we love very much. And um, I work as an editor, too, and I tell my, my clients that. And, and once that clicks in, you know, like... When, when you're talking about those bottles in the wood pile, mm -hmm. I can see that and I can be there and I can understand that deception. That's never happened to me, but I can certainly understand the emotional truth of that moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're all trying to get at. And that's why stories connect us um, so beautifully. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to speak to the idea of the universal I think Tara said it just, just brilliantly. Yeah. I've also <laughs> been a teacher for many, 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 yeah. many, many, many years. And the, the usual first mistake that young poets have is wanting to write about this big thing and going at it from mm -hmm. that vantage point, you know, 
man's injustice to man, climate change. And you just you just can't do it. And one of the first things they learn is what is your story? What is what is your detail in this big picture? And to have faith in that. I think that's part of what we mean when we say finding your own voice. It's not just a kind of voice out there, come to me. <laughs> it's also finding your own story and having the confidence to tell it. And the confidence that someone else will be interested, even if the details change and shift. And Eve, was this almost the path of your book in a sense? Like you were trying to speak about many people's stories outside of your own, and then you found yourself gravitating into your own or? Yeah, I, I, it, it was never gonna be to tell people stories but it was going to be what it was like to have been in that, in, in that, um, in that work, in that job with, you know, just astonishing people. Um, but it, it got, uh, you know, like Rona says, it, it had to come down to the personal. I remember pacing in our backyard <clears throat> when my brother's uh, story started to, when I started to remember, I had very few memories of him. Like, the book retrieved memories. The book gave me back memories. It was astonishing. Writing gave me back memories of him. Um, and I remember pacing in the backyard, talking to a, a dear friend, Chris Welsh, and, and saying, you know, I don't know the form of the book. I, I can't find the form of the book. And I, had, and I, and I would say that, and then I'd tell her a story about my brother. And <laughs> then I, I, I I was still pacing away, and I'd tell her a, a vignette. They were little vignettes. That's all I had. One vignette was he lived in Vancouver near, at Point Grey when he was going to UBC. And I remember going there as a child, and there were gorillas. They had cages of gorillas around the around the house. No. Yes, it's true. <laughs> I thought that was a metaphor. No. I didn't. <laughs> I saw, the cages were empty. The bananas and the and the peels the were there. The cages were empty. Uh. No, he said they took the gorillas out for a walk. <laughs> oh. He didn't say that. There were gorillas, <laughs> um, and so I could imagine my brother, you know, falling asleep to the hoots of these big apes in the city. Right? That's just one little tiny piece. And Chris said to me, she said, "Well, then you string your brother's vignettes through like a string of pearls. They become the form." You know, and so my brother's vignettes throughout the book are in italics, and they, they allowed me, the italics allowed me to write really differently. It was an intimate, intimate uh, connection with him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have more questions, but I, we're nearing the end, and I want to make sure that if you have questions, you have opportunities to get them in there as well. So if anyone has a question uh, lined up, Helen does. Yeah, go for it. And uh, thoughtful um, words and metaphors. Um, I wonder if you could speak anything about anger, if you experienced anger, or how you did have it. So I've just been asked to repeat the questions for the people who are listening at home, just that the question was about anger and, and their relationship with anger through the writing of these books. I'll just be very brief because I wasn't angry. I was despairing. That's mm -hmm. what I felt. And when Eve made that distinction between writing through grief and writing mm -hmm. toward, I think my memoir was writing toward grief because Patrick was alive at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And I, what I was trying to deal with was, oh, my God, what if he dies? What if he dies? Who am I going to be? Mm -hmm. How am I going to keep on living? Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, I never felt angry that he was ill. And I never thought, why me? Why us? It was just, I was scared and vulnerable and uh, about being alone, being left alone. Yeah, I was angry. Um, I was angry at a lot of, anger is, is a part of the grief process. It's a really big part. I, it took a while for me to unleash that baby but when I did, it was actually kind of a relief. You know, I was mad at Holden for making that mistake. It was just a simple mistake one day. Uh, I was mad at myself for not being more present, you know, not, mm. not helping. I was mad at the world. And so I tried to um, 
I just tried to let it be. Um, you know, I grew up in a very, in a family where anger was not readily expressible. So it was, it was hard for me actually to access it. And it, it came as kind of a relief uh, to accept that anger was part of it. Mm -hmm. And no, it wasn't for me. It was, there was so many years, I think, um, even though the hospice work had been closer, um, it was mainly, it was more grief. Other questions? I'm, oh, yeah, go for it, Rose. Well, yeah, this uh, time. I have kind of a grammatical question because you mentioned nouns. You know, I'm using nouns as a way of trying to express grief. And it struck me that that's an interesting contrast to what we tend to think of as writers and editors, namely verbs. The verbs are the, the lifeblood of sentences. Is, is there anything in that? I mean, is there something about verbs that's antithetical to expressing grief or that just doesn't work for expressing grief where, where nouns maybe would? I think maybe uh, if I can jump in, mm -hmm. that I, I, the part about the nouns that I found so moving was when someone dies, whom you love, who you're close to, there's a lot of stuff left behind and it starts to have a presence. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with this toothbrush? What am I going to do with this running shoes? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with the bags of tomato sauce still in my mm -hmm. freezer? Am I supposed to eat? what he made now that he's dead, or do I throw it out? So there's a, a kind of a stasis. And I think things take on an almost supernatural presence when you have to get rid of them, right? Mm -hmm. And and is it good for you to get rid of them? Is it good for you to hang on to them? Who wants them? Who can you give them to? All of those things become embedded in objects. And I think they take on a tremendous character and presence. And how much, how many of those objects can you stand to be around you? That's really interesting. Verbs have movement, but yeah. it seems like a noun Stasis. will just bring you right there. Yeah. I never thought of that before. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. What do you do with the house coat he wore day after day yeah. and you can't bear to see it anymore? Do you wash it and give it to the thrift store? Do you yeah. throw it out? Do you keep it hanging on the hook behind your bedroom door? Yeah. yeah. And then parting with those objects is another form of grief, yeah. too. And they have, they do carry an energy, I, I think, of that person. And so also for me, working with nouns and paying attention to nouns was a portal into scene. Um, uh, um, for example, his clothing, yeah. you know, and, and what did those work boots mean about him as a person and his identity and what he loved and how he moved? So the nouns, I think, can bring, can attract verbs. But for me, they were very tangible artifacts yeah. that I used to um, inhabit Holden as a living person and those uh, we all have our stuff and those were anchors I think is how I use them as a device and the other ironic thing is that the objects outlast the human being yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I got a drawer full of metal shirts <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any other questions? What I think is, just in, in regards to what you guys were talking about and to learn what you were sharing about things, what I think is so interesting about my mother's memoir is her, what it means to explore grief and loss as you go through different communities and cultures. Because of course my, my father, my mom's uh, first husband, is indigenous and we know exactly what to do with things yeah right we have a we have a lot of very set protocols on exactly what you do with things and i think what's so interesting about 
you know, your own exploration of looking through your Jewish ancestry and having indigenous children and then being in hospice, but then also um, having been, because of the relationships you made in Saanich and having been called into so many native homes when people were dying, is just um, weaving together also the different stories of the ways that we lean on, that some of us have certain things that we lean on around death. So when you were talking about like, things and nouns, I just think that was, that's such an important part of your book to me, is also looking at um, the different, the different ways that people approach death and dying, and in our own family, how you gave us the gift to, um, to navigate that part of us, that really important part of us, just how we approach death, I think, so I just, it's like an ode, basically, to something that was really important to me about your book. Yeah, me too. I really appreciated that the fires mm -hmm. and the indigenous practice of throwing the, the wine and the whatever on the fire to help that person. In, and we, at least in my, I mean, I, we don't have those skills and, I, and it's a shame because it leaves you and the people around you who are trying to help you powerless without skills. And I really wish we did have more, more tradition and training and practice in those areas where we knew what to do with those objects. I still don't know what to do with the stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wish, I really wish that I did because in some ways it's, um, it's like, it, it, it's sticky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, you've had to, you've become so good at death because you know it so intimately. You know it so, it's at such a high volume of it in our community. Yeah, yeah. But in that, it, there's gifts because it connects you to a process of how to deal with something I could dress the them ritual, them. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, just keep it yeah. helpful. Yeah. We have time for one more question, and I think you would like to ask uh, it. Yeah, I was uh, when I was listening to the uh, poetry and what everybody had to say, their memoirs, and they talked about language. And my thought and my question was, well, what language are you thinking in? In what language I was writing for, because I thought uh, when you write from a language, either you have to interpret it or you uh, feel that language or you think that language. And I thought when you talk about language, I I felt I wonder. If they're thinking in the language of guilt or anger or frustration, because maybe you can't get the, the thoughts out and you begin to go in a different direction. That's a very uh, unique way of describing language, mm -hmm. language of guilt, anger, frustration. I hadn't thought of that before. That's my my language was sorrow, bereavement. Uh. Well, I know that uh, I started writing way back, and I was told I had to write my story. Yeah. And uh, she told me, you use your own language of thoughts and ideas and lived experience. Mm -hmm. So I quit writing, and I always had the question of uh, how do I write? In my own language, I yeah. only have English as a language that is spoken language, but a language of your ideas and how do you use that language to put on paper that you are speaking in your head yeah. or your heart. Yeah. Yeah. I went, I think it was Elizabeth um, Gilbert who talks about having this crystal or like chrysalis in your mind of what you think your book can be or your writing project, your poem can be. And the difference between this and this <laughs> is the space of agony. Yeah, that's <laughs> very good. And I like that. Because the language, <laughs> yeah. the language And the is, space of failure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The language, it's so limited. Oh. It can't possibly articulate mm -hmm. what's in your heart and your soul and the language mm -hmm. that you're thinking of or feeling. Yeah. It's, it's, it can't, 
it's it's not articulate enough. So that's I think why there is music and sculpture and mm. dance and song and different forms. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. We will have to wrap things up there. Um, I want let's hear it one more time. Let's thank these amazing. Um, <laughs> Um, and just to review, um, all three of their books, I believe, are available for sale outside. And if not, they can easily be ordered um, online as well. But please do, if they're outside, grab a copy and then um, uh, catch these people and get them to sign a copy of the book because they're, they're three tremendous books and uh, I can't recommend them highly enough. Um, <clears throat> just before we stop, we just I just want to thank one more time the staff and volunteers who make this festival possible. Um, and uh, please do thank you to the staff and volunteers on the way out. And please make sure that there's a whole day of activities still to come. I'm sure you all know that already, but you can check out the website if you want to see more of the events that are happening. Please do keep attending events all day and keep supporting the festival. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thank Thanks you. For doing that. That's great.